Hello folks, old Buster coming to you again with another story. This is Recollecting. Well, you know, a lot of these stories now are kind of coming in to fill in the blanks with all the other stories we've been reading. I realize they're not in what you call chronological order, but I did the best I could about putting that because I just write when I feel like writing and when the inspiration comes to me about writing something. So, hope y'all don't get mad at me. But again, I hope y'all write me at Buster and the Boys at Yahoo.com. I would like to dearly send all this stuff to you so you can just read it when you want to and see all the pictures and research we've done. Well, let's get on with it. Appreciate y'all's kindness for dropping in. Recollect. Well, don't you remember when Buster throwed that safety pin with a piece of chewing gum and a green leaf into the canal? Why, he only had a piece of string he got out of his and Grandma's sewing basket to tie it on with, and he done caught that five-pound buffalo. Give it to one of the hired hands for supper. And what about that time when he went a deer hunting for the first time? He went with his and Grandpa Gus and wasn't gone more than an hour before he was back with the seven-pointer. Of course, Buster's Grandpa Gus thought he done killed the doe and was scared to look. <laughs> Buster went to the High Line Road and was just a sitting on a stump with his hate in his hands when he up and see that old buck just a staring at him. Buster was shooting George's British Enfield 303 that he borrowed, and that bolt action worked pretty sweet now. Buster got a little buck fever, as they say. Well, his first shot hit him day twixt the eyes, and then old Buster got a little fractious and shucked every one of them shells out of that there rifle. Had to pick them back up and reload, I'm telling you. Well, when he finally did get a shell in the chamber, he shot him again, but he was so dang nervous about that deer not being dead and all, he shot him in the leg and still the heart. <laughs> of course, the deer was dead anyhow. Then there was a time he went hunting out there at the Davis place with a 22 short and a single shot rifle whilst his folks was a visiting. Come back with two bob white quail. Hit him on the fly. Bullet went through one and then got another in the head. Now talk about luck, two birds with one stone, in this case, one bullet. Remember when the men folk was shooting bow and arrow above the pool hall with the dentist at, at uh, and, uh, Ben? Well, these boys were good hunters. They'd hunted all over the world. And uh, Ben Pearson had a, a manufacturing plant, and it was famous for making bows and arrows. A fellow named Rex Hancock was a dentist over there in Arkansas, and he just went every which a place. He was out of Stuttgart, Arkansas. Well, anyway, back on with the story. Well, George done hit the bullseye on the target, Buster had that little 40-pound fiberglass bow of his, and up and shoots and splits George's air. Had them all scratching their heads, I tell you, and old Rex said, now don't that beat all. Some called out outhouse look, and reckon it wasn't that but it sure does give a fella something to talk about, don't it? Well, I heard Walter was just a jawing while I was drinking some lemonade Miss Oliver made up while she was a visiting Miss Holmes. You know, Miss Holmes' name, first name was Shirley, y'all ain't forgot that. And Mr. Holmes, Mr. Hiram Holmes ain't no kin. Jesse was in from taking up lawyer in there in Tuscaloosa and Buster was down at the VA getting checked out after coming home from the service. Buster was doing all right now, but was a little skittish and a mite fractious about tussling yet. Well, Jesse done told Walter and I that Buster had what they called a survivor syndrome. That's when a feller feels poorly about not being killed when his and buddies and other soldiers got killed in the war and he come through there without a scratch. But knowing Buster, he had it all figured out long before he ever got back home and went to the doctor. Well, heck fire, they all knowed about all that a good while ago. Buster told all them one time that he done figured out that a feller had to know he was as good as he was bad and bad as he was good and walk on the side of light or the side of dark, just like it says in the good book. Well, what happened was that Buster was at the VA is saying about the fatness that done got him, and whilst talking to some doctors there, they done told them he had that uh, survivor syndrome. Of course, that was all done and over with by that time. There just wasn't a name put to it when Buster was dealing with it his himself coming out to service. Well, all the boys just knowed something was upsetting Buster, but 
No deed would come out of it sooner or later. Now, Jesse, on the other hand, done not all tied up in business and just ain't a having no fun hired set. Fact is, Walter wasn't neither. With him gone all the time, a pipeline. Welding always uh, come natural to Walter, but that traveling all over the country takes a toll on a feller after a bit. Lou Ann was fit to be tied with him being gone all the time. Come think about it, hired kind of fit in there with the other boys as well, a working night and day like he did. But he did seem to have more fun than the other three boys, though. So Hired and Walter made up to do something about it all. There was going to be some changes made around here. First off, they done kidnapped Jesse. Walter told Jesse he was just going to have to cotton to the fact that he wasn't going to do no work for at least two weeks. Now Walter and Hired told him that his and Ma done called up to his and work and told him he was poorly and he was going to take off for two weeks or so. Well, she done left word for Jesse there that he wasn't going to get nowhere near a phone <laughs> nor that there computer he was always a pecking on neither. Well, Walter told Jesse that he done grow the mite and put a little bit of weight on so he'd just have to sit on Jesse if he had to, but he was a going, period. Well, the next order of business was the hog tie buster. Now that was a tall order since he was strong as a bull and bigger than half of them <laughs> all put together. Buster was a traveling right smart at the time his himself and when he was in the office he stayed up there to 18 hour a day. Well all three of them come up with a plan and Buster's grandma done called up some of Buster's men and had them to fill in for Buster for two weeks or so. Now that evening everything was set. It was time to put all their planning into action. All three of them went to Buster's office and got him to go with them to dinner. Well, that wasn't hard to do. Now, Buster dearly loved buffets, and the boys took him <laughs> to one out by the airport by the name of the home place. Got all you want to eat except in only one chicken fried steak. Now, Buster didn't recollect when Big Jim took him and all the boys there that time when they fell in the hole. Old Buster got fuller in the tick and was resting peaceful like when they got him on a plane that a friend of Walter's owned. Well, they got Buster on the plane, told him they just wanted to show him something. Buster went to a napping, pretty near before they got in the air, I tell you. Well, after a bit, Buster woke up and then the explaining got serious real quick. Oh, Buster weren't mad, but he was just worried about business, but the boy said it was all took care of. Wasn't going to be no phones, nor computers, neither. Just the boys having fun and resting. Well, all the boys got used to the idea and laughed about it all and settled into slowing down the pace a bit. Well, their first stop was in Florida. The boys still had their dive certifications up to date. And Buster was a master diver now, and it was his and thing, as they say. He was diving all over the Caribbean, different places in the world. And all of them went a-diving with the manatees, and they just took the hired. He was even a-feeding some of their babies. A cavern dive was on the left, so was a pop. That is a 250-foot dive that is down and up with just enough time to get your picture took on a Harley and a Corvette. Now, the cavern dive was a mite tricky, but was a sight to see when you got there. When the boys dove down to the point the dive master took them to, they had to grab a hold of a rope, pull themselves along, and threw the opening in the rock. Now, it got a mite close in that opening for sure, but Buster squoze on through there. He made it without getting stuck. He said he sure enough had some thoughts about turning back, but there just wasn't no room to do that. When all of them got through that hole, it opened up to a great big old room. Boy, it was huge. A beautiful sight you ever saw. Lights they carried showed all manner of rock formations, and there was even air in there so a body could breathe. Don't know how it got in there, but it was there. They all agreed that it was worth the time to see the cavern with all its stalactites and uh, quartz dazzling in the beam of the light. The colors were just something to behold, just beautiful. Fish was a plenty too, and the boys fed them by hand and marveled at nature created by the good Lord. That setting was God's palette and paintbrush of the wonders of the deep. 
Now the boys had some good eating that night with good old snorter, old McBrayer, and then for bed they went. The boys got up late, but eat a good breakfast and headed on out to their next destination. Now, Hired Walter done had it all figured out to where they was going, and Maine was next on the list with a stopover in Ohio. Well, all the boys went to a spa and got muddied up and massaged and steamed and rubbed on pretty good. <laughs> oh, they never seen such hair on the cat. It was a real relaxing thing to do, and late in that evening they got into Maine for lobster for supper. Now, Five Islands Lobster Company in Georgetown, Maine was told to be the best, and the boys sure enough had a time there, I tell you. Ate their fill and then some. Danged if an old Greg and Ernie Fontenot wasn't far from there down Louisiana way. Greg and Ernie was doing some welding in them parts, and Walter knowed them from his welding days, and Buster knowed them boys real well because he worked with them both on a pipeline his and self from when he was doing safety for a company. Danged if Ernie's dog didn't die with the asbestos poison, and then the hurricane come and took off Greg's roof on his and house. Now that Greg would take their singing anywhere he was now. All the four folks eating there was right impressed, but the manager come up to Greg and asked him to stop his and singing. <laughs> well, Ernie up and hit the high ground as he knowed his and brother, and it was right embarrassing to him, but not to the boys. Now it didn't rightly sit well with the manager, but all the folks in the restaurant dearly loved old Greg of singing his songs, and told the manager they wanted to hear old Greg and to let him be. <laughs> that boy, that Cajun. Of course, Greg was a singing country song like they ain't never heard before that. Well, after spending the night and saying their goodbyes to Ernie and Greg, the boys went to whale watching. Now, Buster didn't uh, take to the boat riding too well and was a mite green around the gills. Well, the next stop was Nashville, Tennessee. Buster knowed some folks in the music business there and had the pilots detour a mite for a little visit. Well, Buster and Jesse was getting in the swing of things by now and enjoying their time with all the boys, just like old times. Well, Buster called up Brooks and Dunn and met up with them there and went out to where they had their little racing cars. Well, all the boys each had a car to drive and all of them had a high old time of racing with Ronnie and Kicks. Then they went over and met up with Reba and Narva Blackstock at the Capitol Records building. They landed there in their helicopter and had the boys sit in on a taping of a new album of hers. You know, that's Reba McIntyre. Well, Jesse got to play fiddle on her record and sure was a grinning from ear to ear, just as proud as Punch. Now, he learned to play that fiddle, y'all know that, and he was good, professional-like. Well, Garth Brooks was in town, and when he heard Buster was there through the grapevine, he looked them up and had them over to his and place for supper. Well, after visiting the first spell, George Strait popped in unexpected like there at Garth and visited with them too. Well, he asked Buster if he was going to write a song with Terry because Terry told him he wanted Buster to co-write with him. Dunn had the title, Gone as a Girl Can Get. Well, Buster told George he didn't rightly know just then as he was a working on Edie's song and would see what Terry had to say. Terry was 10% owner of Billy Bob down in Texas, and all the country singers went through that place, you know. Terry also had the house band, and he was married up to Jimmy Joe's sister. That girl could sing herself, but as I hate to say it, I might inexperience because she ain't never been nowhere much of her seen nothing hardly about that city life. Terry said it was like opening up a door to a closet and her seeing the world for the first time, innocent as newly driven snow. Pretty gal, right smart and sweet too. Just ain't had her understanding of these here city folks, he said. Like a lot of us country folks, you know. We ain't either. And ain't nothing like going to Yankee land to get your mind all upset. Well, Terry told a well, good good and on Jenny before they all left. Well, She took the youngins out to McDonald's for something to eat after school, and when she drove up to the window, the girl asked her if she wanted some condiments. Well, she gets all incensed and right put out. And all, and says, well, certainly not. When she got to the house, the music folks were there working on songs and playing the piano. Well, Terry and Terry, 
told the folks the story after the youngins went out to play. She said she told that gal she ought to be ashamed of herself. Them youngins was way too young for them things like that. <laughs> Lord of mercy. Well, the boys left on out and flew into Murfreesboro, Tennessee and went to the Tennessee Miller Coliseum where the road to the horse was held. Each of the three competitors had three hours to break a green bronc and ride and train him and lead and follow her too. Well, Tootie Blanks hated up the show and produced it and she was there when the boys arrived. Tootie seed Walter and come a running and jumped up and hugged his and Nick and about to turn the boy blue. She had quite a few years on Walter and it wasn't nothing like you would be thinking but Walter just had a way about him with all the ladies. Of course Lou Ann knowed Tootie too. Her husband had passed and they had all been friends for quite a spell. When the boys all split up and went their way for a spell, they didn't get to do much with each other. Well, after being introduced to all the boys, Tootie said to them that Walter was the best dang horse whisperer to ride the range, especially them graves. Tootie said to Walter, why didn't he compete? Because she knowed he'd win hands down. Walter just grinned real big and said he was riding a different trail now and really didn't have the time anymore, but he didn't miss it. Buster said he done seed Walter do that horse whispering up to Crow Creek where they owned some ranch land together up there. Old Walter was full of surprises, that is. All them boys had a story to be told. Wasn't no grass growing under their feet, I'm here to tell you. And that's a fact. Well, the trip was the perfect time for them all to catch up on one another and get close again. Then there was New York. Jesse done showed out with his and fiddle, but that wasn't what he was going to show the boys. He sort of kept uh, this to his himself during his college and lawyering days. Jesse was in South America and other parts of the world as he traveled way too much for a family man. But that's how he made his living. When talking about making a living, well that ain't quite true. All of them had money, as you well know. It was like a calling for each of them. They just had things they wanted to do and could do they did do it. Now, well, Jesse done took up boxing for exercise and got real good at it and even got professional training. He also took up all manner of martial arts. Heck, fire, he could karate chop the tire out of a fella if he wanted to. <laughs> well, there in New York was some of his and boxing friends and the boys met him. And them being professional and all meant a heap to the boys and what they was a saying about Jesse and his and boxing ability. He was a sparring partner for the world champion in the lightweight division when he had the time and dang if he didn't knock him out one time when they was a trainer. But the big thing was the boys beating this here old Chinese feller that was a gung fu master. Now that's something. He's supposed to be the baddest there is. He done told the boys that Jesse was the only white man that he ever taught what he knowed. Reckon that was why Jesse was so calm and collected all the time. Feller said they don't demonstrate but would allow the boys to watch him and Jesse work out doing their routines. Dang if and Jesse wasn't quicker than Grease Lightning. Why well, that boy could tap dance on the ceiling I'm telling you. But that old man was nothing but a blur. You couldn't see him coming or going he was so fast. Jesse turned the lights out and the last time they seen the old man he was upstairs. Well, when Jesse flipped the switch back on, all the boys was all twisted up and sitting on the floor and that old man was standing there just a smiling and a bowing at him. Bowing, I guess you'd say. The boys wasn't hurt none, but was he fast? Just the flip of the switch and it was all over. Well, the boys asked Jesse if he could do that and Jesse said, yep, but he took another second or two longer than his master. What really made them boys about swallow their tongues was when that old Chinese feller beginning to rise up, up to the rooftop level of the building and then seeing him come down. There weren't no wires nor nothing else attached to him neither. The way you could tell if he was a coming up or down was by his and robes. Going up they didn't flare out, but coming down they billowed out like a parachute. I have, and that wasn't the darndest thing they ever saw. Just wasn't no explaining that. That old man even broke a two by eight board across the room without even touching it. Push hands he called it. 
Well, Jesse told the boys that there was some things the feller just couldn't cipher on, and it was all in what them Chinese fellers knowed for centuries. California. In California, Hired took them all to see some of his and friends that rode motorcycles. They was a motocross racing, and all of them want, wanted to say hello to Hired, and they all knowed Hired. During the warm-up laps, they got Hired to ride with them, and boy, Heidi, Hired strutted his and stuff for sure. He was a jumping and a wheeling un, and just a skinning back that ear on that motorcycle. Him and a few of the boys he knowed got to racing a bit themselves, and when they all was said and done and back in the pits, they tried to get hired back into racing again. But Hired told him he was just riding for the fun now and not competing no more. Had a bang up time watching them racing and visiting with Hired racing friends, I tell you. The boys used to go to races with Hired, but when he got to traveling all over the country and Europe, they couldn't go. It was a part of his and life they didn't get to share with him, except in through pictures and storytelling. They was all glad they had this time with him there. Then Walter had them all go to the National Finals Pro Rodeo. Walter was uh, right good at riding and roping, and he knowed some fellas there and introduced all the boys to his and friends. They enjoyed the rodeo a heap, and Walter had a real surprise for them. Las Vegas bound. Walter and Hire took Buster to see Elvis Presley, which he dearly loved, and to eat at one of them casinos. The boys just let Lust Buster go at it. Buster sure showed them there at that restaurant how a feller could eat. <laughs> oh, me, folks. The old buffet line was a heap light when Buster was done, and he even got a free t-shirt for the show he put on. <laughs> Whoo-wee! Well, Buster didn't gamble anymore, but on the way out, he stopped and put a dollar in one of them one-armed bandit slot machines. One of them big ones they have at the entrance to the place. Well, that big old wheel went round and round, and then the bells went to ringing, and all manner of lights went to flashing. Well, a bunch of coins then fell out of the machine, and Buster picks them up and begins to leave when this old lady hollers for him to stop. Well, he did, and about that time, all the other boys come up to see what all the fuss was about. The old lady said not to leave because he done hit the jackpot. Wasn't that much, just $500. But enough to make Buster dance a jig. Buster gave the old lady them coins and kept the $500, said this money was for remembering the last time he had ever gambled. <laughs> Lulu knew that, she had just skunked his head. Well, Walter and Hired decided one last stop. Can you guess? Washington, D.C. They went to see Mr. Hiram Holmes at his retirement in Dalton and Devane. The boys visited for a day and evening and relived old times and adventures. B.B. had an awful time of it from a mission that had gone bad and was living with her folks in Savannah, Georgia. Jesse and B.B. never got the chance to make life together after she was captured and tortured in Iran. Dalton and Devane got her out, but not in time. It twerned her body so much it healed, but her mind. She just didn't know come from sickum and ain't nothing changed over the years. Now, Mr. Holmes told all the boys to all go down to Savannah and see her sometime. B.B.'s folks would be right proud to see them all again. Well, after leaving Washington, it was time for home. Getting back was as hard as it was leaving. All the boys kind of teared up and promised to see each other more often. Life seemed to have its twists and turns, but nothing changed one whit between them boys, all brothers. They all said they wouldn't let life dictate to them anymore, but would dictate a life what they wanted. If any of them needed some help in that area, the rest would come a-running to see it was done. Ain't nothing stronger than family, and they are. P.S. Them pheromones of Jesse's must still be working pretty good. You see, Jesse would ease on down to Savannah and see B.B. from time to time through the years to come, and the boys did too. One day, Jesse was down there with her alone on his motorcycle he got from Elvis. It was in tip-top condition still. Jesse kept it that way. He put her on the back of it and took her for a ride in the country. They stopped under a big old magnolia tree on the bank of a little stream, and Jesse up and kisses B.B. He told her to remember the time when they was on her motor scooter there in Cayenne and the good times they had after that. 
On the way back to her folks' house, she squeezed Jesse so tight he could hardly breathe. Jesse pulled over and B.B. was a crying. Tears were just a flowing. She looks up into, into Jesse's eyes and says, she remembers. Well, after that day, B.B. got better and better till she was back to her old self again. Now that Jesse was retired and back at the distillery making old McBrayer whiskey, him and B.B. are spending lots of time together and traveling too. They visit all the boys and Dalton and Devane and Mr. Holmes and just generally take life easy. She stays a while back in Savannah and up in Kentucky with Jesse. Life is good for the both of them now, and growing old is something to cherish and not to fear. Now folks, I know you're confused, but I'm fixing to straighten it out. There are many ways to end this story. Above is one of them, but there's a dilemma. Monique and Jesse's three youngins. It was no doubt that Jesse sure enough cared about Bebe, but did not love her in the way he loved Monique. Jesse discussed Bebe with her, that's Monique, and they had an understanding that she didn't feel threatened at all with their feelings. Not his in any way. She as a woman knowed Bebe loved Jesse dearly. She also knowed Bebe was emotionally damaged from her experience with the presidential court, especially when she was captured in Iran. Bebe went through something no human should ever experience and would never get over it. It is not possible for both women to have Jesse and his and heart will always be with Monique. Fact is, the story is real only in Bebe's mind. It is true that all the boys in Dalton, Devane, and Mr. Holmes, when he was alive, would care for and look after Bebe. They would all go down to Savannah to visit with her and her parents until they passed away. At times, Monique goes with Jesse to visit Bebe, but she thinks Monique is Jesse's sister, Sandy. Bebe stayed with her sister for many years after her parents died and now resides in the finest assisted senior living center in Savannah. B.B. has many health issues now and cannot travel or get around anymore. With advanced dementia, she only remembers the past and the times with Jesse. He is still her rock. B.B. is family, and the boys don't abandon family. Y'all have a blessed day, as the Lord blesses us. Thank you. See y'all later. It's been good talking to you and sharing some stories with you. And they'll be coming. And I again ask you to think about writing me at Buster and the Boys at Yahoo.com. Because you really need to see what I've put together. And I think you'll enjoy it. Well, y'all have a good evening again. And Buster signing out. All right.